Excellencies, colleagues, and dear friends, welcome to the book launch for Survivor's Guide to Money written by Megan Lundstrom. This event is hosted by the Finance Against Slavery and Trafficking Project, also called FAST, housed at the Center for Policy Research at the United Nations University. Can you please go to the next slide, James? I am pleased to be surrounded today by friends and colleagues from the fight to end modern slavery and human trafficking, who have dedicated their time and careers to defend vulnerable populations, serving as bridges in their recovery. I would like to start a presentation by highlighting the Survivor Inclusion Initiative, a part of the toolkit of the FAST movement launched at this place at the General Assembly in September of 2019. It is the project that is bringing us all together today. Ever since, and working closely with the colleagues at financial institutions and support, or support organizations, we have facilitated financial access to roughly 2,000 individuals. To put this into perspective, that number is about two times a fully seated, seated General Assembly room at our beloved UN headquarters in New York. We hope to continue to facilitate access of financial services to survivors in the upcoming years, along with providing them with tools like financial literacy, as well as best practices webinars and trauma sensitivity trainings for our partners in the finance world. But today we're here to celebrate Megan and her book entitled A Survivor's Guide to Money, which I'm holding right now and encourage all of you to get your own copy of. To start us off, I would like to welcome Ambassador Christian Vinavesa from the Permanent Mission of Liechtenstein to the United Nations. Ambassador, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, um, Alex. It's really good to be here um, with you, and I very much look forward to this conversation. Uh, I'm just going to say a few words about about the Fast Initiative um, that you know really originated um, in a way here in our office in a, in, a, in a brainstorming conversation between us and and uh, and you and you, and has since turned into into our the biggest uh, SDG project that we are very, very excited um, about. And uh, I'm very happy to see that our project director, Daniel uh, Telesklov, uh, is in, in the call and will also be speaking uh, a bit about this. So our, our thinking uh, in, in, in this was simply our wish to bring together two of our foreign policy priorities. Um, one is uh, has been a long-standing priority in the in the fight for human rights, and uh, and then our strong commitment to sustainability um, issues. In looking at the at the SDG agenda, we did identify um, the issue of uh, human trafficking and and modern slavery as something where we found we could, given the the expertise of Liechtenstein as a financial center. And uh, and the connections that we have in this respect would allow us to play um, uh, our own role um, in fighting what is one of the, the biggest human rights crises of our um, of our times. This is a complex and multi-layered um, phenomenon, um, and we decided to focus on on the finance side of things. So this was the origin of our of our project, we did set up a, a financial sector commission, which did produce the, the blueprint that is called FAST, Finance Against uh, Slavery and, and Trafficking. And we find ourselves fully in the implementation phase of this project. One uh, of the very important sub-projects of this is the Survivors Inclusion Initiative that, that Alex has, has talked about. And that takes us back to the to the history of uh, FAST, namely the Financial Sector Commission, which um, had as one of its uh, various unique aspects, um, also the inclusion of survivors in the production of, of the blueprint. We always found it uh, extremely uh, important and really of the essence to give a voice um, to, uh, to survivors and to give agency to survivors. And we were very, um, proud and happy to have two uh, very uh, uh, vocal and in inspiring uh, survivors as part of the Financial uh, Sector Commission. So it's a really, really great pleasure uh, to be here today to, to uh, listen to, um, to Megan and I uh, really want to congratulate her on, um, on putting together this extremely important um, 
uh, book. I very much look forward to to your presentation. For us, it's really a bit full circle in um, in um, uh, being in a conversation with uh, with uh, survivors, and uh, I very much look forward to this. So it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, back to you, Alex. Thank you so much, Ambassador. As you mentioned, uh, FAST has been a project uh, in the works for quite some time now, and, and we're just very excited to be able to partner with colleagues like Megan um, and the Avery Center, which is a part of the Survivor Inclusion Initiative and has been our, our friend and, and colleague along the way. So with that said, I want to present Megan to all of you. She's the co-founder and director of research at the Avery Center, which is a Colorado-based nonprofit dedicated to a belief that lived experience must inform change. Megan is a renowned speaker and training, trainer consultant for the United States Department of, St of State and Homeland Security. And on a more personal note, Megan has been, again, a friend and ally to our project. And she has continuously shown her support to helping us understand and integrate survivors' experiences through our program. Megan, thank you so, so much for being here today and discussing the books to help us understand the lasting effects of financial abuse, particularly how they can impact the survivor's ability to gain economic stability. Megan, the floor is yours. Good morning, and thank you so to be here and um, just thank you. Alexandra and um, the FAST team for making this possible. Um, this morning, I really just history of how this um, workbook came to be um, and, and what we're doing with it now and where I I exited my trafficking situation in 2012. Um, I'm a huge returning to school. Um, I was a single mom with two kids and an extensive criminal record and no work history. Um, I had no college education at that point. And so I knew that in order to uh, gain financial stability and be able to take care of my children, um, I needed to, needed to go back to school. And um, I, but I didn't know I was good at. My traffickers had told me that I was not smart and I was not capable of um, providing for myself and making good decisions. And so when I began that journey, looking at um, going back to college and picking out what I wanted um, to major in, I thought, well, I've seen uh, money used in really horrible ways. Um, I've, I've seen systems um, be exploited by traffickers. Um, and, and I also knew that if I just learned how to um, use money as a tool, um, that I would be able to um, gain some stability. And so that was really my logic behind deciding that I wanted to get a finance degree. And um, big picture, ultimately, I kind of, as a single mom, wanted to know how to um, just do personal finances and budget my money. Um, for those of you here that are aware of the finance industry and what um, a finance degree really entails, um, I was in for a huge surprise about halfway through my degree when I hit those core classes. And um, I found myself in um, a very early morning class learning about multinational financial management, um, and foreign exchange and triangulating currencies. And, and I just remember feeling so panicked that I was like, I, I'm not smart enough. My traffickers were right. I don't know how to do these things. Um, but I decided to push through and finish what I had started. And um, I also knew that while finances were an interest to me and ultimately economic empowerment um, of women and marginalized um, populations was really where my heart was at, I didn't see myself term specifically in the finance industry. Um, and so my senior year, I um, did a, um, an independent study and 
with that independent study, um, I proposed developing um, a financial literacy system for survivors of criminal sexual exploitation and sex trafficking. And um, so during those years leading up to my senior year, what I was um, learning in my finance degree um, was really the, the truth behind how um, systems operate, how um, money moves around, how it can be used to um, start businesses and make investments and, and all of those different concepts. And they were all things that my traffickers had distorted the truth around. And so I started to peel back the layers of lies that I had been told and started to understand um, really what it takes to gain financial stability um, beyond what my traffickers had promised me. And I also, through that process, um, being a part of the survivor community, um, was observing a lot of these same beliefs um, and just this lasting trauma from financial abuse. Um, and so being a part of the survivor community, I was seeing individuals who were 10, 15, 20 years um, exited from their exploitation and still struggling, um, remaining in poverty, um, experiencing housing instability, re-exploitation. Um, and, it, and it was really heartbreaking to see those things. Um, and so I realized that I could take what I was learning in um, my finance program and combine that with what I was processing and healing from as a survivor of trafficking. Um, and so in that independent study, I, uh, did, I had a lot of conversations with survivors in the um, survivor community here in the United States. Um, I started taking lots of notes about my observations, both in my own healing journey and in what I was seeing in interactions within that community. And some of those like common barriers um, and misconceptions that survivors were running up against um, as they tried to rebuild their lives. Um, and then I did some research around what, what existed out there that could help you heal from financial trauma. Um, and I found a lot of really great curriculum um, and programs and um, ideas and frameworks that were all built around um, financial wellness, um, but none of them addressed this trauma piece um, at all. Um, so I found um, just general financial wellness programs um, aimed at kind of just the middle class. I found um, programs that were specific to um, survivors of interpersonal and domestic violence, um, but, but nothing really hit what I was looking for. And um, so that's, that's really where I decided there's a gap here um, because as survivors, um, when we have access to therapy and mental health services, oftentimes we're processing um, the physical, emotional, and psychological trauma um, and the abuse that we experienced, but we're really not having a lot of conversations around the trauma that's associated with financial abuse. Um, and, and so that's really where this curriculum I settled on. I want to give survivors this space to process um, and put language to the financial abuse piece, and then also understand how that impacts um, their ability to gain access to resources, um, how they make decisions, um, how we trust others, how we share information, how we set boundaries and goals with finances. Um, and so this curriculum, I, I um, for my undergrad, uh, kind of mapped out an outline um, and a description of what I wanted and a really um, kind of rough idea of, of what I wanted to do. And um, once that was developed, I again sent out that information to the survivor community and asked them for feedback um, on what felt relevant, what felt really unclear still, um, and asked, uh, uh, I think around 10 or 15 people, survivors around the United States, to go through the curriculum and give me feedback. Um, and, and so took that feedback and did another um, iteration of the curriculum. And then here at the Avery Center, um, since 2016, um, when I first started this book, we have also run a job training program for survivors. 
and a portion of that job training program includes professional and personal development activities and coursework. And um, those, those pieces, I, I saw, well, we can, we can just add this financial literacy curriculum into what we were doing in the job program. Uh, and so all of our job program participants since 2016 have also um, used this curriculum as a part of um, one of the requirements for graduation from that job program. Um, and so to date in that job program, uh, we have an 86% graduation rate with 75% of graduates going on to maintain long-term um, economic and um, social stability. And so those statistics are, I'm, I'm so proud of um, our service team and, and what we've been able to make possible through um, that job program. But again, we've had more and more feedback around um, this uh, survivor's guide to money because we've had all of our job program participants going through it um, and providing pre and post survey information and really constructive feedback about um, what they felt was applicable to them, what they felt just didn't didn't fit um, and where they felt like there maybe needed to be more information or more support. Um, so it has been this um, live document since 2016 um, that's been growing and changing and evolving over time. And um, finally last year I said, okay, I think, I think we've, we've gathered enough feedback um, and information from survivors from a variety of of experiences um, that I, I feel like we have something here um, that's going to be applicable and relatable and really start to lay that foundation of processing financial abuse and um, that trauma. Um, and so we finally got this curriculum published in the format that you see here before you. Um, and it's been really exciting um, to see. Uh, we've had several residential programs that have um, purchased the curriculum in bulk with the facilitator's guide. And they are um, using that with uh, the survivors that are in those residential programs. So they're doing it more in a peer group um, format. Um, again, we're continuing to use it in our job training program. And then we also have survivors across the country. Um, we have some supporters who have made it possible that we can provide these at no cost to survivors. Um, so that they can have access to this information and start or continue their own journey of healing um, from financial abuse. Um, so that's where we've kind of, um, we've ended up now. And um, looking into the future, I think um, our, just kind of what comes next is um, limitless. Um, we received um, some financial support from United Way here in Colorado um, to bring this curriculum to an online course format. Um, so as you all know, this last year um, has been incredibly challenging for so many reasons. Um, but one of the, the big um, successes that the Avery Center has seen over this last year is we've been successfully able to move 100% uh, of our direct services and resources um, to online formats. And so this workbook is, um, we have it in the physical print version, but we're working on moving it into this course format. We'll just, and that will just increase accessibility. And so our vision with this online course format is that again, individual survivors can have access and go through that course independently, um, but also residential programs and peer support groups can have access um, through a facilitator and peer group um, framework so that they can run their own group and um, support the survivors that are a part of that. They can view the coursework as it's being completed by each participant within that group. So we do ex expect to see that um, available by the end of 2021 and really excited for that piece. Um, but again, I think, I think out into the future of what's, what's next. And really this curriculum is, it's the first of its kind. It's the first time um, we're having these conversations. 
Um, it's the first time a lot of survivors are learning about these concepts and making connections to their past experiences um, and current behaviors and thought patterns. Um, and I, I think there's so much potential for um, just so many opportunities um, for additional financial wellness projects to come from this. One of the things that has been really neat, we've seen it um, with the um, Survivor Inclusion Initiative um, and some of the FAST um, financial institutions that are a part of FAST um, is uh, starting to purchase these workbooks and, and go through them with a financial advisor who's paired with a survivor. Um, and I, I think that that just brings just an additional element to what is possible here. Um, I am currently mentoring one of um, our job program participants, and they have a financial advisor um, who's in their local community, and together they, they get together about once a week or every other week, and they go through one chapter of the curriculum, and they talk through it, um, and, and it gives space for that survivor to process their experiences um, and really identify what barriers currently exist in their own journey to financial stability. And it allows the financial advisor to understand the greater con um, context around what has happened to the survivor um, and how they might be able to support them with finding um, financial tools um, and resources that can um, help you know, resolve past issues um, such as, you know, credit, um, lots of creditor issues, um, financial fraud, um, all of those things that really have to be untangled once a survivor exits, um, just to kind of get them up to present day where they can then start building towards the future. Um, so, so again, I think, um, I think everyone here um, that's joining us today, uh, whether you are somebody who holds lived experience um, if you are in um, the financial sector, if you are in the nonprofit sector, um, I, think, I think that we all have something to contribute um, to the economic empowerment and financial stability of survivors. Um, what we know from our research here at the Avery Center is that individuals who are able to reach um, that, that place of financial stability um, their likelihood of re-exploitation and re-trafficking in the future is drastically reduced. Um, so that's, that's always been one of our um, priority goals here at the Avery Center with all of our direct services. Um, but I, I want to really highlight why it's so important that you all are here and, and you're all um, aware of how important this is and what your role can be in that. Um, we did a study a few years ago. It was kind of just a preliminary, um, more of a straw poll than a study, I would say. And uh, we looked at the different types of capital people have. So this can be education, relationships, um, actual economic assets, um, all, of, all of those different pieces, employment history, education, all of those things combined to create um, financial stability. And what we found is um, probably not a huge shock is that one of the, the biggest things that victims of trafficking lose during their exploitation that traffickers take away is their social support. And um, what we looked at kind of longitudinally is once somebody exited, um, which types of capital were they able to access um, and rebuild and how did that correlate with other forms of capital? what we found was that relationships are number one. Survivors, as survivors, we need relationships. We need relationships with people who can open doors, who can encourage us, um, who can help us navigate um, making connections in the community and um, just as, as we learn and heal and grow. Um, and so what we found is that survivors that really struggled after their exit to form healthy, trusting relationships in their community are the survivors that struggle economically for the longest period of time after exit. Um, so it's, it's really not as simple as um, just money. Uh, economic stability comes from relational stability. Um, and, and so that's why I think ultimately that every single person here today plays a role 
um, in a survivor's stability because in, in some way, whether it's um, as a friend or a mentor or a coworker um, or as a financial advisor, um, you are providing a safe relationship for that survivor to grow and learn. Um, and, and ultimately we see better outcomes when again, I just want to thank everyone so much for attending today. Um, if you have already purchased one of these workbooks or plan to do so, um, I'm, I'm so incredibly grateful. Um, and again, thank you, um, to, uh, the FAST initiative. Um, and the survivor and, and such a, a great rewarding experience to be a part of the survivor inclusion initiative. And I look forward to um, continuing that work and continuing to build relationships um, with you amazing professionals and allies in this space. Thank you. Thank you so much, Megan. Um, I, I am in awe, honestly. You, you are a pioneer of this type of workbook. Um, you've helped so many people overcome their difficulties in trying to mend that relationship with, with money. And you mentioned very well, you know, it takes a village. Um, and that's what we are trying to do here, not only at FAST, uh, but at SII, is bring, bridging those relationships from two groups of people that don't necessarily talk to each other every day, which are, you know, financial institutions and survivor support organizations, to try and, and fix that, um, make things work and make make things better for survivors so i two things i encourage everyone to please get your your book um, that i'm trying to hold here there you go uh, it's available through amazon we received a couple of questions on, on how to get it um, and the second thing is that we have a q a box uh, at the bottom of your screen so please if you have any questions add them there if time is permitting we will answer all of them at the end during the q a portion Thank you, Megan, again, for your intervention. Up next, we will be having uh, David Passarelli. Dr. David Passarelli is the Executive Director of the Center for Policy Research at the United Nations University in New York. He, has, he oversees new institutional developments, partnerships, and growth strategies for UNUCPR, as well as being a leader in research and policy advisory in the areas of migration, inequality, and development. On a more recent note, David has been an integral and key, pl key player and partner for FAST as we enter into a new phase of the project that will keep us running for the next couple of years. David, over to you. Thank you, Alex, and thank you, Megan, uh, for your interventions. Uh, I enjoyed reading your book. Uh, I went through it rather quickly, um, but uh, I thought it was uh, a really wonderful example of a practical tool to engage uh, this community. Uh, the advice that you give in the book is, is very practical, and it, it, I was, it goes from processing grief to tax advice and helpfully breaks down what I think is the abstract elements of banking and finance into tangible and accessible advice uh, for survivors. Um, I think also what your book makes clear is that putting survivors on a path to financial independence requires that we recalibrate our understanding of the starting point. The risk in the research community, the risk in the finance community is that we're starting at too high a level of analysis. And your workbook, I think, grounds us. It brings us to the very essence of financial literacy. And it points out the difference between access to finance, the existence, if you will, of financial infrastructure and financial literacy tools. So the actual use of financial services to address vulnerability, and they're not the same. Um, what your book does is make an important contribution to the demand side of finance and banking. It's demanding work, but it's transformational work also reaching individuals to ensure that they have both the understanding and the tools, but ultimately the motivation and the confidence to engage with what is an increasingly complex financial system. At FAST, uh, we believe that building communities of practice, which is essentially what we've been talking about on this call today, is, is really necessary. And that communities of practice 
provide essential platforms both to educate financial service providers and also make explicit the needs and obstacles faced by survivors. Um, one of the reasons that uh, communities of practice fail is that the members don't view their participation in a community of practice as meaningful for their daily work. And I think the participants that are here today uh, really demonstrates that we do find that this is a meaningful conversation and that it's meaningful for the financial sector and the banking sector's daily work. It's, uh, I think also a community of practice is an effective tool for the cross pollination that we need between these two communities to make sure that form, so banking infrastructure doesn't get ahead of function, which is providing services to those who need them. So I will stop there. I'll congratulate you on what I think is a, a very tangible and practical uh, work and, and perhaps leave you with one question, Megan, for later. Uh, and that relates to digital financial literacy and whether uh, with the increasingly complex forms of credit, uh, digitalization of finance, uh, you are seeing an increased appetite in this community for financial di digital literacy and how the Avery Center may tackle that going forward. Thank you. Over to you, Alexandra. Thank you, David. Um, up next. Can you hear me? It well, seems to be seems 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 There we go. Apologies for that. It seems we're back on. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Great. Uh, this is the wonders of the post-COVID world, people. <laughs> we, must, we must let the show go on. Okay, up next, we have Lou Walker and Vanessa Whale from HSBC in the UK. They have both been partners of SII for quite a long time. Um, and I have to say, extremely involved in the whole process that, that has um, occurred through, through SII through um, its inception back in 2019. Um, they've been amazing friends and colleagues. And I have to say, Vanessa is the Financial Inclusion Vulnerability Manager at HSBC in the UK. She's focused on driving strategy for all customers and ensuring that they are supported with their financial well-being and services. Lou, on the other hand, is focusing on deliver delivering initiatives for all customers uh, ensuring inclusivity and vulnerabilities are considered across all aspects of the bank. So that's that's a lot of responsibility to work with. Uh, Lou and Vanessa, the floor is yours. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks for letting us speak today. Um, we're really, really happy to be here. So thanks ever so much for having us. Um, what a lovely introduction as well. So thank you for that. Um, really just to um, cover off today, Lou and I are going to speak um, between the two of us. I'm gonna give a little bit of background to um, some of the work that we've been doing within HSBC UK um, and primarily our Survivor Bank initiative. So, as you'll be acutely aware, financial services um, have a real vital role to play in providing access to survivors of modern slavery and human trafficking. Um, and previously, HSBC has led a lot of work in creating and publishing um, financial crime related human trafficking indicators for the UK and Europe, which subsequently led to us holding um, quite a lot of awareness raising workshops in addition, and then more focused on the victim side of, of this crime, we conceived and piloted the Survivor Bank initiative. We identified that trafficked people um, were still being treated as criminals through their potential arrest um, and the subsequent legal process that may follow. And as a consequence, traffic survivors wouldn't have um, any other option really to return to criminal gangs and the abuse would continue. The Survivor Bank initiative is aimed 
really and solely at supporting survivors um, and allowing them to integrate back in society with the objective of gaining access to banking. One of the major blockers that survivors um, face, as, as, as you'll be aware, um, is integrating back in society and as I always label it the kind of missing jigsaw piece of the puzzle um, and primarily and pr sorry previously um, that major blocker has been in the form of the standard identification requirements that normal banks or standard banks would require. So we wanted to find a way to change that and remove the barriers that survivors face. So we worked um, very, very um, hard <laughs> within our um, organization to try and create a process that would allow um, us to do that. And in collaboration with the Salvation Army, we commenced the Survivor Bank pilot in June 2019. That allowed survivors access to a basic bank account. Um, the, the service is focused on people who are part of the um, national referral mechanism and they are receiving ongoing support with their charity. By providing access to the basic bank account, uh, HSBC UK is providing individuals a route into the banking system and also to the um, support with, with basic banking and some of the um, being provided with tools to help them um, continue. But we're also ensuring that we're protecting them. We're also ensuring we're protecting the charity that is introducing um, the survivor to the bank and we're protecting the bank through our, um, our um, vigilance that we that we put in place around risks. We're the first financial provider to offer this type of access to bank accounts. Um, we've had tremendous success with the initiative, um, but what I'll do just now is hand over to Lou um, and she's going to talk about the service in more detail and share some of the success stories. Thank you for that. Hi everyone. Um, yes, yeah, so the, the objective of um, Survivor Bank ultimately is we help survivors rehabilitate into society by allowing them to gain a level of independence during an extremely difficult time in their lives. Um, and hopefully we protect them from returning to the previous life of abuse that they had. Um, because at this point they're then accepted into mainstream society. And from a bank's perspective, from a financial point of view, um, we're giving an enhanced customer experience. So we can actually say yes to people who feel that nobody um, gives them a chance. So the way that it works for us, um, when we're doing the training, branches are selected based on um, the need in their area. And they are, they are trained up as champion branches for our Survivor Bank initiative. Um, what we do is we select um, individuals of staff at each of the branches who are um, really great with empathy skills um, to be able to ensure that they can give people the time and space and understanding that they need. They are provided a one hour face to face training session where we go through um, a pack to understand human trafficking and modern slavery as an overview um, the facts and figures around it along with how branches can help disrupt human trafficking networks, um, spotting the signs of human trafficking. The background as to how HSBC UK became involved with the Salvation Army Human Trafficking Department and the, how the initiative came about, along with the Survivor Bank process. And then also we've got a banking basics guide that we, we go through as well to help survivors once they've got accounts. So, Along with the individuals being selected for empathy skills, we've put a real emphasis on being able to care and nurture for these individuals when they come into our bank. So that starting point begins at the moment that they open that account. Um, we want them to, to feel safe and secure and be able to ask questions, um, as well as feel that if they're in town one day and they feel a little unsafe or they're a little unsure about something, that they can come into the branch and feel that they're in a safe space and in a safe arena. Um, and we can support with that. During the training session, um, people have the chance to talk about their previous experiences. So we'll touch on um, anything where they may have identified and highlighted human trafficking or whether maybe that now they're looking back, they go, oh, I wonder if that was that. And, and it's made them more alert to things that are going on. We've also um, had a few stories where, where people have actually reported it and, and we've, we've managed to, to um, get traffickers um, prosecuted. So I think the training is a testament to, to making people more aware of what is going on around them. 
Um, the training is a safe space to be open and honest. So if they don't know about the subject, they tell us they don't know, we, we will arm them with the tools to ensure that they do. Um, HSBC UK Survivor Bank Service has been running now for 24 months after the initial launch in January 2019. And as Vanessa touched on their conversations with the charities and, um, and the clients have, have given us good feedback and, and they've been able to go on and change their lives, which I think is pretty amazing. Last month, we reached our 100th branch uh, milestone and we currently have 131 branches across the UK that are opening accounts for survivors as we speak. Um, we have today opened 942 accounts, meaning that we've changed 942 lives and 421 of those was during last year's pandemic. Um, so it shows that even with the world changing, we can still continue to help and support and give people access to the banking system. By offering this service, we have been able to build a stronger presence in our communities and as champion branches, these are supporting organisations in other ways with financial education, collections and donations and volunteer opportunities. And sharing the Banking Basics Guide has been invaluable, not just to survivors who are provided with it, but also the organisations, because they can work with the survivors to understand more about banking. Um, and this ensures we're providing the tools to help financial awareness and understanding, which is so important for people to move forward. Thank you so much for the time, Alex. Thank you, Lou and Vanessa. Um, you mentioned something very interesting, which is, you know, it, even during the past year where a lot of people might think that things slowed down, well, that's not been the case for, for the survivors. Um, and as we all know, human trafficking has just skyrocketed since the pandemic. So we all need to uh, be aware of this and make sure that we are providing the best services that we can and, and try to help each other out as a network that we have become um, throughout this uh, changing time. Up next, we have Nicole. She is a marketing assistant for the Avery Center. Uh, her favorite part about working with the Avery Center is their motto, lived experience must inform change. She is currently finishing her bachelor's degree in sociology uh, she's a toddler mom and a dog mom as well. In her spare time, she enjoys yoga, meditation, writing, reading, and spending quality time with nature. Nicole, over to you, and thank you so much for being here today. Hi, thank you. Um, so I just wanted to start off by saying that I'm like super grateful to Megan and the Avery Center for everything that I've been through since working with her. And she's just been like a really big inspiration to me. Um, I feel like at my start of working with the Avery Center, I felt like super disconnected from the world, like the square, square world. Um, and I didn't know anything about financial literacy at all. Um, I was still going through the process of realizing that I had even gone through, um, trafficking or abuse. And I didn't know that financial abuse was even a thing. So when I started to read her book, um, it really helped me to change my life and um, gave me the tools that I needed to get out of my situation and start to create a new life for myself financially and physically. Um, I felt like her way of writing is really down to earth. Um, she put in her personal stories, which I was able to relate to on many different levels. And honestly, like when I was reading her book, it made me feel seen because a lot of the things that she was bringing up, I didn't know that other people had also gone through. So um, it helped me to realize that my inner critic that was telling me that like I was gonna be broke forever and the only thing I was good for was my body was really not coming from me. And um, one of my favorite parts about her book is at the end of every chapter she has a check-in where she says check in with your body see how you're feeling which was really helping me with um things that i was going through um to be aware of my emotional state and to be aware of how the just learning about finances or even doing math was like affecting me uh, i feel like at first when i saw 
the math part of the book I was like uh oh like I'm not gonna be any good at this I don't even want to like mess with it at all but then I was able to go through it and it was simple enough for me to actually understand and actually build my confidence as well um another thing that I learned from the book was the difference between a growth and a fixed mindset which I didn't realize before and I feel like she had given examples of that and um we create our own examples from the book in like a really applicable way that was easy to understand um and it, it really helped to make financial literacy like seem like it was actually less frightening for me and now I've been able to start building credit and be ready to even dream of like having a house or any kind of financial security in the future because I feel like I never even thought I was going to have a future so I didn't really plan for it and now it's like now the doors are open for me to be able to do so many different things in life and I really thank Megan and the Avery Center for that, especially. Thank you so much, Nicole. Um, I think it, it, on behalf of all of us uh, here at the panel, and uh, we just got also a message from Barbara Gose. Thank you so much for your honesty, Nicole, and for sharing your personal story. We are very grateful. Um, okay, thank you. It is, it is so important to keep survivors' voices right in front and center. Uh, it is why we here at FAST and even for the predecessor pro project, the Financial Sector Commission, we have integrated survivors all around, all around the way. You guys are our inspiration and what keeps this motor going. So thank you again, Nicole, for your intervention. Up next, we have a very dear friend and colleague. Uh, she is one of the people who has helped us actually create the Survivor Inclusion Initiative along with Barry Koch, who's probably on the call right now. Um, Sarah Crow, the amazing Sarah, she is the Director of Strategic Initiatives of Financial Systems at Polaris, which is a US-based nonprofit uh, trying to end sex and labor trafficking in North America. In her role, Sarah leads Polaris's efforts to partner with the financial services industry to implement a comprehensive and industry-wide strategy to intervene in the crime of human trafficking. So Sarah, thank you again for waiting. You are the last uh, speaker of today. Um, thank you for your patience and uh, for always continuing to be such a good friend to our project. Over to you. Thank you, Alex. And I have a, a bit of a tough role um, following up on some really powerful um, and amazing uh, speakers, but I'm so happy to be here. Um, I'm such a big fan of Megan and this book. As you can see, I have my copy here. Uh, one day when we meet again, I'm going to get Megan to autograph it for me. Um, but I wanted to start with kind of a short story about the first time I learned about this book and kind of the significance of it. So as Alex mentioned, I've been lucky enough to be involved in the FAST Survivor Inclusion Initiative for a few years now. And about a year or so ago, you know, time, uh, hard to tell time during this pandemic, I believe it was about a year ago. Um, you know, I was kind of thinking about opportunities for more financial literacy programs that were designed for survivors of trafficking specifically. And at at first, I was thinking about all of the kind of the typical components of a financial literacy course, you know, kind of the basic financial information that everyone needs, you know, kind of what Megan was speaking to um, with what a lot of financial literacy courses entail. And then, you know, I've worked in trafficking for a while. So I was trying to put a, you know, think through the, the, this community um, and maybe particular needs. And I started thinking, oh, maybe there should be um, a more extensive uh, section on uh, uh, security and and um, protecting yourself from identity theft for this particular population, you know, those kinds of things. And then um, one day I was speaking to Megan and I mentioned, you know, that we were thinking about these financial literacy programs and she said, oh, well, I just happened to have developed a whole financial literacy curriculum for survivors who had experiences similar to mine. I was like, oh, okay, great. Well, check like uh good i'm glad somebody did that finally um and then she started to tell me about the curriculum she had developed and really the focus on the emotional safety planning and kind of addressing 
the trauma response um, a lot of survivors may have when it comes to dealing with money. And that was a very humbling moment, I think, for me, because I have worked in anti-trafficking for a decade now. Um, I have worked very closely with survivors, um, but I honestly had not even thought about that kind of lasting emotional impact of financial abuse and what, you know, kind of the long-term impact of having been kind of commodified the way many trafficking survivors have been. Um, that was just a lens that I had not thought about or thought to include in a financial literacy program. And now in retrospect, having read the book and having talked to Megan and others, it, it seems so obvious, but again, uh, really without expl explicitly being told about that dynamic and that um, concern, um, I didn't think of it. And I think for us, all of us who work in the anti-trafficking field who have not experienced trafficking ourselves, um, it's really important to stay humble and as allies really recognize that we have so much to learn from survivors. I think for too long, people without lived experience have made decisions about what survivors want or need. Um, and that's often meant guessing. Sometimes that's been educated guesses, um, but nonetheless guesses. And despite being, I think, well-intentioned and, and trying, um, I think we've often missed the mark, honestly. Um, and I think it's okay to admit that. Um, I think we've designed services that sometimes maybe aren't appropriate. I think we've set up eligibility requirements for accessing those services that are sometimes not feasible for a lot of survivors. Um, and I think the anti-trafficking field really does have a lot of work to do to become truly survivor-led. And we all have a role to play in that. So we need to make sure that survivors are leading the moment, the movement and not tokenized, not asked to tell their story and then dismissed. We need to make sure that survivors are paid for their contributions and their expertise, just as you would compensate any expert consultant. Um, and then really, I think we all need to be able to admit when we've made a mistake or we didn't think of something. Uh, we need to be open to continual learning and improvement. Um, and I've been really fortunate to work with FAST now on the Survivor Inclusion Initiative for a long time. Um, I'm very proud of it and kind of the steps that we're making towards supporting survivors in their, um, in their journey towards financial stability. Um, I'm also proud that I think the Survivor Inclusion Initiative very much came from hearing survivors um, and the obstacles that they were articulating, the challenges that they were facing and trying to um, really address those issues that were being highlighted by survivors. Um, and, um, you know, we've learned a lot along the way. Um, I think uh, kind of bureaucratic processes <laughs> very rarely uh, have effective mechanisms for handling any kind of special circumstances um, and opening financial uh, accounts often kind of falls into that category. Um, you know, what I've learned um, from many in the financial services industry that within existing regulations, there are a lot of accommodations that can be made to deal with special circumstances. But uh, making those accommodations from the bank's perspective, you know, that's can be time consuming, it can be a lot of work. So just as uh, Lou and Vanessa were talking about, you know, this has been a whole infrastructure that HSBC has had to set up to make sure that they're doing this in a really thoughtful way. Um, and so it's been really significant that we've seen those kind of efforts now from major financial institutions in the US, Canada, and the UK. Um, and they're really willing to invest the time and resources that it takes to get those accounts open for survivors um, and to take that extra time. And that's exciting. Um, so to date, 2000 accounts open through the program with more opening every day. Um, we're continuing to expand to more jurisdictions and we are trying to remove barriers um, and open up access to the program as much as we can knowing you know there are some realities of the regulatory frameworks in which we exist but really trying to be as inclusive as possible and, and hearing from survivors the challenges that they face um so if anyone watching is at a organization that provides social services to survivors of trafficking 
you think your clients could benefit from this program, please reach out to us, Alex. Uh, I'm sure we'll be happy to, to talk to you. She's been amazing in taking a lot, on a lot of this work and a lot of the outreach that we're doing. Um, and I'm excited to see the program grow to become more accessible to more survivors and also to hear feedback from survivors of what is, what is working, what do they need, what are the things that really help them accomplish their goals as defined by them. So, you know, maybe it's small business loans, maybe it's uh, lines of credit, maybe it's more financial planning, uh, really allowing survivors to shape what this program looks like. So very proud to be here today and thanks so much for the invite. Thank you, Sarah. It's it's truly been a journey. Um, and, and the way that I've discussed it with, with you and other colleagues is, you know, we. We are all learning from each other, gaining experience as we go, and, and we must adapt. Um, especially when when you when you hear survivors' voices and and you hear what actually works on the ground, um, that's that's when you're actually making a change. Um, over to the Q and A portion now. Uh, there's a question from an anonymous attendee for Megan. Uh, have you considered developing a version of the workbook? that would include the economic considerations and experiences of survivors of labor trafficking in the future? Yes, I, I think that's a great question. And it's something um, that I was actually just talking with one of my team members about is, again, thinking about what's next, like what are the, I think um, the, the activities in this workbook are applicable to anyone who's experienced financial abuse. And, and so I think really where it um, centers on commercial sexual exploitation and sex trafficking um, is in the sharing of my lived experiences in each chapter to give relevance to the activity that's then done. Um, so I would absolutely love to do um, kind of a, another version of this workbook, um, but bring in experiences from folks who have experienced um, labor exploitation and trafficking um, to, to give those experiences context in the same way. Thank you, Megan. Another question, this was coming from a, another friend and SII partner, um, Larissa Maxwell over in Canada. She says, Megan, this is incredible. From a survivor support agency, your work is powerful, timely, and have we have seen, as we have seen, so needed. Healing must include financial recovery. Do you see a future where survivors are supported to have professional roles in finance as a part of full circle inclusion? Yes, 100%. Field um, or sector, a professional sector that um, survivors are just starting to be invited into. I think Sarah kind of touched on anti trafficking work at large, but like when we really look at the financial sector and like how are survivors being included right now, um, I think there's so much opportunity. Um, and uh, I mean, here at the Avery Center, again, we're super passionate about economic empowerment. Um, and so our job training program has everything from entry level, um, like retail and sales opportunities to uh, marketing research, um, where, where we're providing living wage employment apprenticeships um, for survivors to build out their, their career path. Um, and I, I think, I mean, as survivors, like we, we understand how money works and um, we're fast thinkers, um, we're super observant, um, we're, we're able to pick up on patterns and synthesize information very quickly. Um, those are all transferable skills. And I think um, that bringing survivors into this, the banking sector, um, it make the, the banking sector stronger um, and more accessible to all people. Thank you, Megan. Another question, and this might, this is this one is really it's uh, director to Megan, but I think maybe um, Lou and Ness, you might want to step in here as well. It says from Assis Frutan, what can financial institutions do to prevent victims of human trafficking from being financially abused by traffickers? 
Do they need to put new rules and regulations in place to limit traffickers? Um, no, sorry, go on, Lou, and then I'll follow up. No, no, go on. I was just checking if you were taking it. Go on, you're fine. No, I was just going to say, I think um, specifically from our perspective within HSBC UK, we're always working um, with our colleagues internally. So the, the stakeholders who, who are obviously um, have, I guess, the responsibility in this area, it's all of our responsibilities, but our financial crime teams, um, so the FCC and FCR teams are off internal fraud teams. Um, and I guess it's making sure that we are supplying or um, equip, equipping our um, frontline staff, all of our teams, with as many tools and as much awareness as possible that will enable them to um, identify potential victims and then what that subsequent call to action should be that they can offer support. Um, we're very, very focused on um, financial abuse, financial and economic abuse at the moment, and domestic abuse, actually, and it is one of the areas that um, within Lou's team, they are focusing on over the next, probably the next six months um, to a year. Um, so there is a lot of um, work happening in that space. Um, I think it's just a case of collaborating with internal stakeholders, external stakeholders, utilizing as much in intelligence and information that we can get to actually improve what we're doing and to offer that support. Um, Lou, anything from you? No, I think you've you've covered it all off. I, I guess the, the ultimate thing is ensuring that, that staff are trained and that staff have the awareness of everything that's going on around them. And I guess that was touched upon in the in the discussion about the bank account is, it's amazing how many people don't know what's going on um around them to highlight it so yeah i'd love to just kind of um, piggyback off of what lou and vanessa said and um i've been working with polaris on their um, financial working group the aml working group for gosh sarah how long has it been maybe six months not long um but um, Sarah, can you talk a little bit about uh, the project that we've been working on with bank statements? Because I think it ties back into this question around like, what does even financial abuse look like so that banks can identify it? Um, I'm really excited for the project we've been working on. Sure. So um, a lot of the work that I lead um, is in the anti-money laundering world of helping financial institutions un uh, understand what trafficking looks like in financial records and differentiate between traffickers and, and victims whose accounts might be used. And so one very kind of innovative project that um, I've been working on with Megan is actually Megan provided her bank statements um, from I think a 10 month period, maybe longer than that. It was probably a long, 20 month period, sorry, um, in which, uh, Megan had experienced trafficking and exploitation. And we kind of collectively sat down with um, some of our, our AML contacts at, at big financial institutions and really talked through um, those transactions and those patterns. And it, again, it was one of those very interesting experiences of there were some things that people saw as maybe suspicious, um, but there was a lot of nuance and subtlety there that we really missed without kind of Megan giving that context and that story explaining some of the pieces of it. So for instance, you know, one of the patterns we identified was kind of this pattern of um, her trafficker providing her just enough money to um, meet the, the expenses that were kind of on the table. So maybe she'd get um, $300 at a time and then she would have bills and different expenses that added up to like almost exactly $300, like $298 kind of things. And, and you know, that's a form of financial control and financial abuse that was, you could see there in the records, but really not something um, that we were necessarily recognizing. And so I think projects like that and having those conversations is gonna um, do a lot to help financial institutions understand what this really looks like and build more effective monitoring systems there. 
Thank you to the four of you. Um, moving on, there's uh, a quick question on the institutions that are part of SII. Um, here's a quick list. Uh, can you go to slide 11, please? There we go. So on the left, you will see the financial institutions. Um, they're not only in the US, those are uh, in the US, Canada, and the UK. And then on the right side, we have the survivor support organizations that are also part of SII. Um, we, can, we can leave the slide here, but there's also a couple of questions um, of, for, of course, Megan. Um, Megan, the first one is, will this uh, workbook be translated into other languages? That question is coming from Paola Richias in Puerto Rico. And then the next question is, Megan, do you see a version of this tool being targeted towards people in vulnerable situations to prevent them from finding themselves victims of financial abuse? That's the second one. And I'm gonna also include here, uh, David, a question for you. Is this a space that FAST will be active in? Oh, great questions, um, and I will try to remember them. Um, so the first question around translating into other languages, I that would just be a dream come true to uh, just make it more accessible to more people um, and would love to have follow up conversations about making that happen. Um, and then the second question, um, remind me what that was, Alex. Do you see a version of this tool? So your workbook being targeted towards people in vulnerable situations to prevent them from finding themselves victims of financial abuse. Yes, I like I said, I think this is this is just the start of what uh, survivor directed financial wellness can look like. Um, and I think we're all in agreement that it's great that we're learning to identify trafficking and provide services after exploitation has started. Um, but ultimately, I think we all want to kind of go upstream and stop it from happening before it ever begins. Um, so I, I love that idea. And um, I, I think, again, there's just so much potential to do something like that. Thanks, Alex. I think you wanted me to come in on that second question as well. Uh, certainly in this next iteration of FAST, over the next three years, uh, we will be looking at new forms of vulnerability and macroeconomic societal changes that are increasing vulnerability, increasing the possibility of individuals uh, being trafficked or falling into modern slavery. Um, specifically, we're looking at new regions, uh, you know, what it means for economies that are rapidly shifting, uh, for example, decarbonizing, and so the economic makeup of their economy is shifting, what it means for them um, to, uh, to put in place practices that prevents uh, people who are out of work, who have to transition sectors, uh, from becoming vulnerable to human trafficking. So certainly the what we've called the frontiers of vulnerability will figure more prominently in the work that FAST does over the coming years. Over to you, Alex. Thank you, David. Um, we have another question coming in. There's there's plenty. I'm trying to, to dilute them. Um, can you speak more on the recidivism, re-exploitation of survivors, Megan? and why economic independence and agency in financial decision-making is key to preventing that trend. Yes, I'll try to summarize it quickly because I feel like I could probably take a whole nother hour um, to unpack um, just that economic instability and how it creates this extremely vulnerable space for survivors. Um, as we all know, this, this is a financial crime. That's trafficking occurs because traffickers want to make money and they want to make the most money possible. Um, and they're typically targeting people who are economically marginalized um, and living in poverty because they're promising um, offers of employment or um, financial stability and um, just kind of a relief from those financial burdens uh, that people find themselves in. Um, and so when somebody 
exits their exploitation, um, it's a journey. It's a journey to freedom. And uh, I just here at the Avery Center, 100% of the individuals that we walk alongside um, are living below the poverty line at the time of exit. Um, and, and so there's such a huge correlation between that. So if you have someone who has um, just drawing on my own lived experience and um, what we know about commercial sexual exploitation, um, you have somebody who exits the commercial sex trade, um, maybe they have a lack of education or employment history, and um, they find a minimum wage job. Um, but it's it's not enough. It's not covering their bills. It's not providing them with safe housing, um, maybe affordable childcare. It's it's not meeting their basic needs. Um, and so there's a gap at the end of the month, every month, where there's more bills than there is income. And that right there is that opportunity um, or vulnerability for relapse uh, to the commercial sex trade or um, other offers. Uh, that feel like they're going to meet that economic need, but end up being um, proposed by exploiters. Um, and, and very quickly, it just grows. Um, so I, I think that that's so important. And it can be, um, there's actually an exercise in the workbook that I call catastrophizing. Um, as trauma survivors, we're really good at catastrophizing because we've experienced a lot of catastrophes. And so um, oftentimes, some of that trauma, that trauma response is thinking about what is the worst possible case scenario that could happen. Um, and so there's, there's a whole chapter going through different scenarios. So one of the favorite ones that I like to give an example of is um, you're, you're already 10 minutes late to work um, and your car breaks down on the side of the road um, and you've already been maybe written up twice at work and the third time you're going to be suspended or terminated and you go to call for roadside assistance and your phone is at 2%. Um, so it's kind of this like worst case scenario moment, but these are the moments where that vulnerability occurs, where somebody can pull up alongside that um, survivor on the side of the road um, and, and offer to help them, um, but create, start to build a relationship with that person as somebody who can meet those basic needs and help them in that moment. Um, or it can trigger a trauma response where that survi survivor feels like this, this is too hard. There's too many things that I'm battling at any given time. Um, at least in my abuse, I, something was predictable. That abuse was predictable at some level. I knew what to expect. Um, and maybe some level of my basic needs were getting met um, in a very harmful and abusive way, but they were being met nonetheless. Um, so that's just one example. And that's again, why it's so important for us to have these social supports in place in these relationships so that when those catastrophes happen, because they happen to all of us, um, but, but being able to reach out to a safe person and say, I'm having this crisis situation. I don't know what to do, I need help and knowing that you're gonna have people that respond and support you in a safe and healthy space so that that relapse doesn't occur. Thank you, Megan. Uh, moving on, this, I believe this question is, is for um, Sarah and maybe David can step in as well because we have a project that, that works on this. What role do you see data analytics or AI playing in the identification, identification of human trafficking and finance? Um, uh, sorry, I was just reflecting on what Megan was saying. This is a bit of a hard pivot. Um, I mean, I think ultimately AI and technology can play a huge role, um, at the very least, um, you know, a lot of kind of automated alerts and, and technology set up using AI, um, can kind of make things more efficient that allows people, um, within the bank to spend a little bit more time investigating um, and really making a thoughtful decision about um, what they're looking at. Um, so I think there's tremendous potential there. I think the thing that um, is a concern and something that we need to be very conscious about is that you know so many of these data models and technologies are built off of systems of essentially 
um, confirmed cases or cases that were known to have happened, um, which often means uh, prosecuted cases, cases that went through the criminal justice system. And we know that the cases that end up being prosecuted in most jurisdictions are really just the tip of the iceberg. And they can also reflect systematic uh, systemic biases within those systems of what cases get prosecuted. Um, and so I think the thing that we need to be very mindful of is when we're building out that truth set of the data that you wanna build a model off of, that you're making sure to be really inclusive in that truth set and recognizing that um, you know, law, enfor like law enforcement cases or criminal justice cases, prosecuted cases is, is a tiny percentage of the true um, issue and, and just kind of recognizing that bias and trying to account for it. Yeah, no much to add to that very coherent uh, response from, from Sarah on a challenging question. Um, I mean, I think what Sarah was pointing at is that the, the analytics, big data analytics will only be as good as the typologies that we build into the algorithms. But also, and, and Sarah spoke very competently to this in another panel that we were on, um, I think what we're going to see is a great degree of innovation in the way uh, traffickers use new technologies uh, to exploit. And cryptocurrencies is one, there's been a lot of discussion about this. And so the big data analytics that we're talking about today and the type of analysis that we're doing with data is going to have to evolve to address new technologies and new platforms that are generating different kinds of data. And it's going to require an entirely different form of analysis um, of that data. And we need to be one step ahead and start to think about how we build algorithms that don't look at existing data, but at the future data that will be generated. Over. Thanks, David. Uh, one last question, I believe, unless somebody else comes up with another one in the next couple of minutes. One of the challenges for full financial literacy is to have those who, those who could potentially facilitate the curriculum pieces to be financially literate themselves. Any thoughts and plans on how facilitator training or training of the trainers could be expanded to areas where there are those at risk of trafficking or vulnerable populations? And for example, frontline service providers who work in areas such as children's aid societies, shelters, school teachers, those who work at faith-based institutions or who work with migrant workers. Megan, I think this is for you. Oh, I would love to see so much education, so much more education and training go into um, facilitating um, both the workbook, but also just financial wellness in specific communities, both on the prevention and the response sides um, of this issue. Um, and, and I think it's a great idea. I'm taking notes from all of these great questions and feedback, um, and I'm going to be taking them back to our team um, to look at what, what is next. What does um, the financial sector uh, need from the Avery Center uh, that we can continue to equip professionals on that financial advising side? Um, how can we support um, NGOs and direct service providers um, with direct um, interactions and peer support groups and access to our online curriculum? So um, thank you. And I, 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 love, I love these ideas and uh, hopefully we'll be sharing more soon with, with what we're gonna do next. Beautiful. Thank you, everyone to the panel. A big clap to all of you for your time and expertise. Um, James, if we could go back to that uh, slide 11 quickly before we close. So again, this is just one second. This is the list of all of our partners. And I want to thank them as well for being a part of SII. Um, and again, congratulate Megan for her hard work and, and just publishing this amazing workbook and facilitator's guide. Um, we will be sending a link after the event that includes not only a survey, but also information on how to get both copies because we've requested that yeah, we've gotten requests for both copies for the facilitators and the survivors. Um, next slide, please. We invite you here at FAST to listen to our podcast, which is available on all platforms. 
We cover different topics related to finance and modern slavery and human trafficking. Uh, there's an episode on the Survivor Inclusion Initiative. It's episode four. I highly recommend it to everyone here on the webinar. And in addition, we like to well, uh, also invite you to take the Aikens uh, Fighting Human, uh, Human Trafficking and Modern Slavery Certificate. It's free. Uh, super recommended. A lot of people from all around the world have taken it, and uh, I myself have taken it. It's it's very good, and it gives you an, an overview of, of the problem, and it, it just sheds a lot of insight on what's going on. And last but not least, thank you again to all of our panelists, colleagues, and friends for taking the time to discuss Megan's books as well as any other questions you might have had for, for the panelists, for, for our banking colleagues in the financial sector, uh, for David, for Nicole to sharing her story, uh, for Sarah for giving us her insight from the Survivor Support Organization. Um, and of course, Ambassador Vanavester for his support through the Liechtenstein Initiative and all of our, all of our funders and partners along the way. If you have any further questions, please feel free to reach out to me individually at c-e-r-q-u-o-n-e at unu.edu or emailing uh, the, if we can go back to the slide, James, uh, for general inquiries, it's info at fastinitiative.org. You can find us also on Twitter and LinkedIn uh, through Fincom Slavery or the Financial uh, Sector Initiative for Combating Human Trafficking and Modern Slavery. Thank you everybody again for your time today. It has been a pleasure to host you and we continue to be involved moving forward and hosting future events. Please stay tuned. Take care. Bye everyone. Have a great week.